Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Bible Study. For broadcast times in your area of these studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now it's time to begin our Sunday study with your speaker, Chris McCann. Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Afternoon Bible Study. Today will be study number 26 of Jeremiah chapter 50, and we're continuing to look at verse 42. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses. Everyone put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. In our last study, we went to Psalm 46. Psalm 46, and I'll read the first three verses. And it says... In Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength of every present help and trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. And here in Psalm 46, we see that the uh, waters roar and are troubled, as it says in our verse in Jeremiah 50, 42, their voice, speaking of God's elect people coming against Babylon, shall roar like the sea. And the cause of the waters roaring and being troubled in Psalm 46 is the mountains being carried into the midst of the seas. And that's significant language because in um, the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus gives um, a, a mini parable where he, well, first of all, it's a historical parable because he curses the fig tree and, and Jesus actually did that. And then he speaks to his disciples and he says, since they were marveling at that, that what he had done concerning the tree, the fig tree, they would do also. And more than that, if they had faith, they would cast a mountain into the sea. And we've looked at this before, at that parable, and we've seen that he is saying to the people of God that their faith, that is, when the time of the end comes around. God's judgment first on the church will be a spiritual judgment. Then on the world, there will be a spiritual judgment that can only be discerned through the eyes of faith. And, and therefore, through faith, God's people will, first of all, curse the fig tree as Israel represents the churches and congregations and the people of God understand from the word of God that the, that the church age has come to an end, that judgment began at the house of God, the fig tree is cursed. Then secondly, more than that, they will also cast the mountain into the sea. And Babylon is referred to as a mountain in the Bible. And, and so as the world comes under judgment, which Babylon typifies the kingdom of Satan, this world, in the day of judgment, and only God's people see this or understand this, are able to discern these things through the scriptures, then again through faith. The mountain of Babylon, the kingdom of Satan, has been cast into the sea. In Psalm 46, it speaks of mountains, plural, and uh, this would relate to all the kingdoms or rules of Satan as he is pictured uh, as the beast that, that has seven heads, and Revelation 17 tells us the seven heads are seven mountains. And, and so it pictures his complete rule throughout all history, in the day of judgment, now coming under the wrath of God. And of course, if you cast a mountain into the sea, the water will certainly be troubled. It, it's, um, to use a small analogy, it's like having a glass of water and you drop some ice cubes in. 
the water is stirred up and rises. And if you put too much water in the glass, it'll overflow because it is dispersed by these objects being cast into it. And spiritually, that's the picture God is giving us. And this relates to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, the chapter dealing with the time of the end. And we read in verse 25, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And and notice it it's at the time immediately after the tribulation uh, when the spiritual lights of the sun, moon, and stars, what they represent the gospel, go out. And this um, is tied to distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, because the mountains have been cast into the sea. It is judgment day. The people of God are proclaiming this, and spiritually these things are happening. Well, uh, we spoke about this, and also that God is our refuge and strength, a present help in the trouble of the evil of Judgment Day. And I'd just like to look at one other place before we go back to Jeremiah 50. And that's in Psalm 9. In Psalm 9, beginning in verse 7, it says, But Jehovah shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Jehovah also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Now notice how God puts that together. First, he says in verse 7, he has prepared his throne for judgment. Verse 8, he will judge the world. He shall minister judgment to the people. And then in connection with that, hand in hand, because it says also, Jehovah also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And it's just further confirmation that God's people will be living on the earth in the day of judgment, which is a grievous period of trouble for uh, all the people of God. And yet, God will be our refuge at that time and strength. All right, going back to Jeremiah 50, verse 42, Their voice shall roar like the sea, And they shall ride upon horses, everyone put in array, like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Now, once again, God is referring to his people here in and and throughout Jeremiah 50 and 51 as a great mighty army that is coming against Babylon. But we should point out, we should point out that the Bible pictures two battles that have taken place or will take place in this world. And the one battle, it was a long-standing, raging battle throughout time. From the fall of Adam and Eve into sin until... 13,000 years later, over 13,000 years, on May 21, 2011, when God would shut the door of heaven. And that was a battle between the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom and Satan and his kingdom of darkness. The Lord went forth conquering and to conquer, as we read in Revelation 6, carrying the gospel into the world. And how did the Lord do that? Through his people, sending forth his people as messengers of the gospel. And and therefore, the people of God were instrumental. They were 
They were a part of the fight in the battle that continued throughout the day of salvation. And Satan went forth, as he's pictured, and also in Revelation 6, riding a red horse to counter and to oppose and to be contrary and to come against the Lord and to take peace from the earth to uh, to prevent anyone in in darkness from being translated into the light uh, to fight against um, the the word of God that brought salvation and and so that battle warred and and continued in century after century after century we read in Deuteronomy chapter 20, Deuteronomy 20, in the first um, four verses, it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for Jehovah thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be terrified because of them. For Jehovah your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And and that um, really defines and explains the spiritual battle that had been underway and ongoing throughout time during the normal course of affairs in, in this world. God's people went forth in the service of God to the battle, but God even then said, don't worry, I will fight for you to save you, because he had to do that particular work of salvation. It was his work. God would determine whom he would save, uh, and how many, and in what time, and what season. That was all uh, God's doing and God's will, and so he fought in the battle. He uh, he was the one who would save his elect people through the the ministering of his word, the sending forth of the word of God into the world. And this was the typical situation in this world. There has been constant spiritual warfare all throughout time. Now, we have to distinguish and differentiate that warfare from the final battle, the final warfare that takes place in the day of judgment. And and, uh, I think some people get mixed up and confused about that. And we, we find something interesting in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, which I think is a historical parable that speaks of judgment day. And in 2 Chronicles 20, King Jehoshaphat of Judah is afraid because um, a great enemy army is coming against the people of Judah. And a prophet rises up that tells him not to be afraid. We read in 2 Chronicles 20 in verse 15, And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith Jehovah unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still. And see the salvation of Jehovah with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, 
nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for Jehovah will be with you. Now again, this is also in keeping with what we read in Deuteronomy 20, that the people of God will not need to fight. And in one sense, that's always been true throughout the history of this world. God, in the spiritual realm, God does the fighting in the spiritual battle to save. The people of God are there, are instrumental, are constantly involved because they are uh, the feet on the ground. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good news. As God does battle with the enemy, with Satan and his forces, and accomplished his purpose as the word of God um, would not return void, but God would use it for the purpose of saving those he intended to save, of bringing a word of judgment to the rest. And and God says that he fights in that battle. But, you know, um, some people have gotten the mistaken idea, and, and it is just completely wrong. There is nothing anywhere in the Bible that would teach this. But it is a mistaken idea that that we are not to declare truth, we are not to publish or uh, to share these things to the world concerning Judgment Day because we are not to fight in the battle and and references made to Second Chronicles 20. That, well, you see, Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah did not fight. Well, we have to, again, keep in mind the distinction. Uh, the Bible speaks of two battles, one battle all throughout time, through the history of the world, in which the battlefield is the souls of men, God going forth to save, Satan doing everything in his power to resist. And it is true and correct that God's people no longer fight or are involved in any way in that battle, in, in that typical normative battle that we have fought in, in, again, to do service to the Lord Jesus Christ in bringing the word of God and that battle that God would actually do the fighting to save. We do not participate any longer. And it isn't an interesting, right after May 21, 2011, the printing presses that printed tracts such as Does God Love You went silent. The, the people of God stopped going forth on track trips to carry the message of salvation. And, and God's people realized that we're not to share these things or give encouragement to people any longer to cry out for mercy that God might save them. And all this happened right after May 21, 2011. Now, some people have gone back from that, and they're talking once again of salvation. But God's elect have, have not gone back from that. The true believer maintains and holds these things. The Bible which is the most important thing, has not retreated, has not gone back from the position that May 21, 2011 was Judgment Day. And God, by that point, had saved all of his elect. The last one to be saved had become saved. And therefore, the, the battle was won. The battle was completed and finished. And there was no need, no cause to go into the world with the gospel in the former manner, in an evangelistic way, to find lost souls, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was all over and done with. Therefore, the people of God no longer were to be involved in any way. And it, through their lack of involvement, through abstaining, through 
their refusal to bring the gospel, God actually used his people to fight in the other battle, the the next battle that comes, the battle of Judgment Day, which is distinct, again, from the previous battle, because this battle is not being fought over souls of men. God is not fighting to save. God is fighting to destroy. God is fighting to punish the wicked. And yet the people of God are involved and and instrumental and carriers of the message of the Bible, just as before, but it is for a completely different purpose. And one major way that God uses his people to fight in this battle is through their refusal to involve themselves spiritually in the fight of the previous battle, uh, of the battle over salvation, the battle with Satan's kingdom. Oh no, the people of God say, we, we are, we're not to give false hope. We're not to encourage anyone along those lines with the expectation that there may be salvation when salvation has come to an end. Now, does the Bible speak of the people of God fighting in this battle of Judgment Day? And again, just as God is the one who pointed out um, in Deuteronomy 20 and also in Second Chronicles 20, uh, it, it's pointed out in Second Chronicles 20, is, again, I think, a historical parable referring to the Day of Judgment. And in both cases, it's pointed out that you have no need to fight, but the Lord will fight for you. And and so God is the one that fought throughout the Day of Salvation to save. God is the one who fights in the Day of Judgment to destroy And the people of God are helpers, messengers, servants to God in order that he accomplish his purpose in both of these battles. And let's look to the Bible to see what God has to say about the battle of Judgment Day. Revelation 19, and we're going to read several verses. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 14. And um, actually, I should start a little earlier so we see that Christ is in view in verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. And then verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now this is describing Judgment Day, and we see the Lord Jesus upon a white horse. And notice the end of verse 11, in righteousness he does judge and make war. Judgment Day is a battle. It is warfare, final warfare, but it is warfare between Christ and Satan, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, Babylon, the kingdom of Satan. And and the armies in heaven followed upon white horses. And who are these armies? Well, we're told that they were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. How does that help us to identify them? Well, it it does because earlier in Revelation 19, in verse 8, speaking of the bride of Christ, and that bride is comprised of all God's elect, it says, and to her, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen 
is the righteousness of saints. The righteousness of saints. God's elect people. Sinners. Dirty, rotten sinners who committed multitudes of sins. And yet Christ washed them all away, purged them from them, and clothed them, as it were, with fine linen, clean and white, all pure now, all holy, no sin to be seen. This is the righteousness of the saints, which is the righteousness of Christ. Wherever we read that that clean and white fine linen, we know that it is a true believer, one of God's elect people that are in view. Well, here we see that the armies, the elect of God, follow Christ into battle, into the war of Judgment Day. And and in that battle, in verse 15 of Revelation 19, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. That is, in Judgment Day, in the time of judgment, in the day of the wrath of God, God will smite. His weapon will be a sword that protrudes forth from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God. As as the Bible speaks of the word of God as a, a double-edged sword, the word of God is the weapon that God uses to destroy the enemy in the final battle that um, the Judgment Day is. Well, let's go to Joel chapter 2. And I hope we have enough time to read even half of the verses that I would like to go to. But Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of Jehovah cometh. For it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong. There has not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. What what was our verse in Jeremiah 50, verse 42? And, and what did it say? Well, their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses. Everyone put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. And then we find in Revelation 19, Christ on a white horse, and the armies of heaven, who could only be the, the elect people, also on horses, fighting with Christ or going forth following him in the day of battle. And now we find this great people, a great army that that shows itself in Joel 2. And their appearance is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen shall they run. And then in verse 5 of Joel chapter 2, it says, Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Now, what, uh, what, what is being burned up in the day of judgment? Wood, hay, stubble. Here's, here's what the Lord says in Malachi 4 in verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud... Yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith Jehovah of hosts, that shall leave them neither root nor branch. And 
Notice in verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Jehovah of hosts. Now, obviously, God is not talking to false prophets in Malachi 4. He's speaking to his people. And he's saying that he will burn up the wicked, the proud, as stubble. And the next thing we read is that they will be ashes under the feet of the Lord's people. And and that's what we see here in Joel 2 with this great army that comes and um, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. And I'm going to keep reading here in verse 6. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heaven shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Again, we find this army that can only be the people of God. They are coming immediately after the tribulation, because Joel 2.10, uh, the, the language in that verse, pinpoints the time. Uh, it, we're very familiar with this language of when the sun and the moon is darkened immediately after the tribulation. And God utters his voice before his army, and he is strong that executeth his word. We saw the word of God in view in Revelation 19 in, in the battle that Christ is waging in the day of judgment. And here, too, in Joel, God's people are um, in view as the Lord does battle with the wicked in the day of judgment, and the word of God is in view. Now, let's go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9. And we read of locusts destructive locusts. Now, one interesting thing about locusts is that they destroy en masse. There, there are just um, multitudes of locusts that swarm and destroy fields and crops. And, and this is a picture of God's elect that are a great multitude that were saved out of great tribulation and God views them as locusts. It says in Revelation 9, 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And then we read in verse 10, um, no, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll read through and go back to verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. Now, again, 
their the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. We see the connection, the the tie-in with Joel two, with Revelation nineteen, as Revelation chapter nine is without any question a chapter describing judgment day. It's describing the period after the tribulation. Revelation 8, God took much time and and care in describing his wrath upon the third part, which pictured judgment beginning at the house of God. And then he said there are three more woes. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitant of the earth. And Revelation 9 and following begins to discuss those three woes to the inhabitant of the earth because the judgment has transitioned from the church to the world. We find early on in Revelation 9, the sun is darkened. Um, As it says in the end of verse 2, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. That matches the time period after the tribulation, just as Joel 2 mentioned the sun being darkened. And in that context of the sun being darkened, we find a mighty army. Now, this army is is called uh, an army of locusts, but we have to remember this is the Bible. And God uses all kinds of types and figures to typify important teachings from his word. And, and so they go forth like unto horses prepared unto battle, the battle of judgment day. And uh, we, we read a little further on in Revelation 9, the figure changes, but, but the battle is consistent. It's the same battle in Revelation 9, um, verse 15. And the four angels or messengers were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. Now I'm going to continue reading, but let's stop there for a second. Did you see it? The number of the army of the horsemen, the horsemen, again and again and again, horsemen come into view. In Revelation 19, God's army is on horseback. In Joel 2, they are like unto horses put into battle array, and and horsemen put into battle array. The locusts were like unto horses prepared for the battle. 200 million, and that number represents all of God's elect. Now, it could be an actual number. That is, it's very possible that all the names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life were 200 million. It it could be the, the actual number of all those that God saved, or it's just an enormous number to represent that. We'd have to allow for that possibility. And either way, though, it is God's elect, and the picture is all of God's elect. Every single one of them are coming. They are the armies of heaven that are following the Lord on his white horse. And, And this army is all of God's elect. And notice in verse 17, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth. And in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Notice the strong emphasis on fire, smoke, and brimstone issuing out of their mouths. 
And um, I'll, I'll just go to this one verse to explain why that is. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33, the last verse of the chapter, and I'll look at the second part of verse 33 in Isaiah 30. It says, He has made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of Jehovah, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. The breath of Jehovah. The word of God is inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 exclaims, and the Greek word translated as inspiration is a compound word made up of two words, God breathe. All scripture is God breathe. And uh, Isaiah 30.33 said, the breath of Jehovah, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. God's breath, his word, is like a stream of brimstone. And, and coming out of their mouth, issuing forth is fire and brimstone. Here is the army of God, the people of God, declaring forth the word of God. Which word has been turned by God as the season has turned? Now when people go to the Bible, there is only judgment. There is no more mercy to be found. And, and God's people declare the teachings of the Bible in every age, in every season. And we can only say what the Bible allows us to say and permits us to say. And as God has shut the door of heaven, the Bible reveals that. And we must share that. We must share that. There is no option. There is no option on our part to refuse to share it, to conceal it, to hide it, to not participate in the sending forth of its message, of the Bible's message, which some people are doing today. And, and these people, they, they're true believers as far as I know, but they continue to abstain and not want to get involved in sharing tracts that say, spiritual judgment began, or no more salvation. Oh, no, no, I, I don't feel right about that. Well, let, let's see who comes with God. Who is it that participates in God's judgment, whether we like it or not? Uh, we, we may not like this is the time we're living in, that it is the day of judgment. We may not like the fact that the day of salvation has ended. We we could have enjoyed that very much, and of course all of God's people did, and and been heavily involved in that work, but for whatever reason, we're, we're just uncomfortable with the whole idea, and of course the people of God naturally would be, since they have been ambassadors of peace, they have been messengers of mercy in, in time past. And certainly there is a period of transition where we are uncomfortable and don't understand what God has done. But we're also coming down to the conclusion of Judgment Day. In all likelihood, on October 7th of 2015, which is a little more than a year away, and are we going to get involved at any point? Are we going to get off the sideline at any time? as though God's people could be on a sideline when he is involved in a task and a work that is as important as this. We read in 1 Corinthians 6, in verse 2, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now, maybe you've come to this passage and, and you found it helpful to help you in making smaller decisions in life, which is one of the uh, minute 
teachings that is found here. Yes, uh, we, we can uh, look at this and say, well, you know what, since God's saints, the elect, and I'm one of the elect, I believe, are going to judge the world, then I should be able to make smaller decisions about ordinary things going on in my life. Since judging the world is such a huge matter of discernment, and the wise will understand, they will both understand time and judgment, Ecclesiastes 8 tells us, and yet we can't get away from this statement. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? They will judge the world. This is a biblical statement. This is the Bible's declaration. It's not mine. It's not any man's. This is coming forth from that inspired word of God. It is God breathed. This is part of the fire and brimstone that is being breathed through the word of God. And it's God's breath that kindles the flame in the day of judgment. Do ye not know? Let me ask you that question. And I'm asking myself and all, but especially to people who are holding back. Do ye not know that the saints will judge the world? If you're holding back, apparently you do not know this. Apparently you're uh, at least unsure of, of key aspects of this truth. The saints will judge the world. Yes, God, the Lord Jesus, is going forth, but he doesn't want us to miss the fact that the saints are with him, that the saints are the ones we read in Jude 14, the book of Jude, verse 14, that little epistle right before the book of Revelation. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Ten thousands pointing to the completeness. All the saints. And we, we read in Zechariah, in uh, Zechariah 14, verse 5, that the Lord cometh with all of his saints. And so that's confirmation. Ten thousands, the number ten pointing to completeness of whatever is in view, Ten thousands of his saints, the elect of God, come with Christ in judgment. And when did Judgment Day begin? May 21, 2011. That's when Christ came as a thief in the night. That's why Joel 2 speaks of that army also as a thief, because we come with him. What he does, we are following him. And notice here in Jude, it says, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And then verse 15, To execute judgment upon all. This is what the saints are actively doing in the day of judgment. Executing judgment. Now, we're not to think this means we have some sort of weapon an actual weapon to destroy. No, what is the weapon? The sword of God, th that which issues forth out of the mouth of the 200 million, like fire and brimstone. The word of God, the declaration that God has opened up as he has revealed his righteous judgment in the day of his wrath, as Romans 2.5 tells us, is that in which we execute judgment. In Psalm 149, Psalm 149, and uh, you know, this is just touching the surface of the number of scriptures that are involved in teaching this doctrine that God's people actively are with him participating in the day of judgment. I've only gone to a handful. I have many more here that, that we could go to, and I, don't, I know we won't have time today, but in Psalm 149, verse 5, 
Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Again, the saints of God. In verse 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Let's identify that sword. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. In verse 7, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. The judgment written. Do you see how all these verses are coming around to the same conclusion? They're all coming back to the same teaching that that Jeremiah 50 has already told us to publish these things, to speak these things. And we'll, we'll look at that verse, hopefully, but let me finish here in Psalm 149.9. To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all, ten thousands of them, have all his saints. Praise ye Jehovah. And you, perhaps, want to hold back. You want to conceal these things. You don't want to talk about them. You don't want to order tracts, or if you have them, you're not going out with them as before. You're not sharing this information. Why not? Why not? In the light of all these scriptures, you believe it's Judgment Day, you understand it's Judgment Day, but you're continuing to hold back. Why is that? In Jeremiah 50, God started off this chapter, Jeremiah 50, which is a tremendous chapter describing the day of judgment. And notice how he begins it in verse 1, the word that Jehovah spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet, declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish, and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken. Now, notice the incredibly great emphasis God is putting on declaring these things. He, first of all, he says that, declare ye among the nations. There, that's one time he's telling us what to do. And publish, number two. And then, uh, thirdly, and set up a standard. And then again, publish. Four times he's told us in uh, just a portion of the verse. And then he goes on to say, and conceal not. That's five times. Conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken. Six times. He's, He's driving the same point home. Publish these things. Say these things. Conceal not these things because he knows. He, he knows what happened on May 21, 2011. He knows the uh, scorn, the ridicule, the reviling. He knows the confusion the people of God were experiencing immediately after, in the early days after the Great Tribulation and the early days of judgment and the tendency to not know what was happening, to uh, to sort of um, uh, hold back from everything because we didn't know what the Lord was doing. And, and so he hits that point directly. Conceal not. Don't hide this information. Don't think that you're not to share these things. The commandment of God is to feed sheep. How are you going to do that without speaking forth and declaring to all the nations, because that's where they're at. The great multitude is scattered amongst the nations of the world. You must indeed publish these things to feed sheep. And while you're accomplishing that task, you will also be accomplishing the task of proclaiming against Babylon, the wrath of God. As it says in Jeremiah 50:42, they shall ride upon horses, 
everyone put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship Sunday Bible Study. For more information or to hear additional Bible studies, be sure to visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com.